Few child stars have ever achieved the level of celebrity that Shirley Temple had. Nicknamed Little Miss Miracle, Shirley Temple's work helped carry American audiences through the Great Depression. But behind the stardom, Shirley Temple experienced financial strain and a troubled marriage. Born on April 23, 1928, Shirley Jane Temple was just three years old when her mother, Gertrude, perceptive of Temple's burgeoning talent, signed her up for dance lessons. But the decision wasn't entirely selfless. Gertrude herself had wanted to become a dancer and was intent on her daughter succeeding where she had failed. It was at the dance school that Temple was discovered by producers from Educational Films Corporation. Despite the name, the shorts made by the film distribution company were oriented more toward the comedic than instructional. In 1932, Temple was cast in a series of shorts called Baby Burlesques, where children played the satirized roles of adults. Temple's first speaking role occurs in the second Baby Burlesque short titled War Babies, where Temple plays an exotic dancer as toddlers and diapers ogle her. Her first on-screen kiss came when Temple was just five years old. According to The Atlantic, the set of Baby Burlesques wasn't the kindest place for children. If anyone misbehaved, they were sent to sit on a block of ice in a black sound booth. Temple wrote in her autobiography that she didn't think that the black box did any permanent damage to her psyche. However, Temple would later tell an interviewer that the lesson she took away from the black box was simple, wasted time is wasted money. Shirley Temple's roles in Baby Burlesques caught the eye of Fox Film Corporation, which would later merge with 20th Century Pictures in 1935 to create 20th Century Fox. Songwriter Jay Gorney is credited for bringing Temple to 20th Century Fox. After seeing an episode of Frolics of Youth, another multi-part series produced by Educational Pictures that Temple appeared in, Gorney was struck when he saw Temple entertaining fans in a movie theater lobby as he left the screening. He was so charmed by her that he promptly arranged for Temple to audition for the film Stand Up and Cheer in December 1933. She quickly got the part and was signed to a two-week guaranteed contract worth $150 per week. By the end of the month, her contract had been given a year extension, as well as an option for seven years. Stand Up and Cheer, which came out in 1934, was Temple's first major motion picture. And by the end of the year, she'd been given a starring role in Little Miss Marker as well. She appeared in a number of other films in 1934, but the musical Bright Eyes is considered to be the film that made her a star. Bright Eyes was written specifically for Temple, and in it, she sang what became her most popular song on the good ship Lollipop. See that? That's mistletoe. Between 1935 and 1938, Shirley Temple was Hollywood's top box office attraction, beating out stars such as Bing Crosby and Clark Gable. Her film Curly Top, which came out in July 1935, made $1.1 million at the box office. According to the BBC, Temple is even credited with keeping 20th Century Fox from bankruptcy, especially due to the success of the film Bright Eyes. In the midst of the Great Depression, President Franklin D. Roosevelt even credited her with raising people's spirits, referring to Temple as Little Miss Miracle. Temple appeared in at least three movies a year between 1935 and 1938, sometimes upwards of eight, often playing an orphan whose optimism was reassuring to audiences during a time of economic turmoil and uncertainty. John F. Casson, author of The Little Girl Who Fought the Great Depression, wrote this about Temple's films. They were not meant to change the world, but to summon the emotional resources simply to persevere in it. Temple's popularity led to many products being created in her name and likeness. Temple-themed merchandise included raincoats, dresses, and accessories. There was also a Shirley Temple doll made by the Ideal Novelty and Toy Company. According to Collectors Weekly, the doll was officially announced in October 1934 and came outfitted in a polka-dotted dress similar to the one worn by Temple in Stand Up and Cheer. In 1935, the Shirley Temple doll accounted for almost one-third of all doll sales, even though it cost three times as much as unlicensed dolls. Her iconic hairstyle was also imitated by many. And while there are conflicting accounts of the drink's origin, the Shirley Temple drink is also named after the child star. But funnily enough, Temple herself wasn't a fan of the drink, saying that it was too sweet for her taste. Temple also turned down many offers to license her name for the mocktail, noting that she doesn't like the idea of cocktails, even non-alcoholic ones, for children. By 1935, Temple was making $1,000 a week just from merchandising, and by 1936, her royalties from licensing exceeded $200,000. Despite the fact that Shirley Temple was making a great deal of money, she didn't end up seeing much of it. After Temple had signed her studio contract in 1934, her father George became her manager. And although he fought repeatedly for pay increases, it was more for his benefit than his daughter's. By the end of 1935, Temple's salary was $2,500 per week, and in 1936, it rose to $50,000 per movie. According to The Atlantic, in 1938, at $307,014, Temple was making more money in a year than anyone else in Hollywood other than Louis B. Mayer, one of the co-founders of MGM. But when Temple was 22, she discovered that even though she had earned over $3 million, she reportedly had only $44,000 in her account. 
With the spending of her parents and her father's mismanagement of her wealth, Temple was left with a fraction of the fortune she had earned. But despite everything, Temple later wrote, quote, I felt neither disappointment nor anger. Shirley Temple was regularly treated poorly during her film career. During the 1932 film Runt Page, Temple got an ear infection and had to have her eardrum lanced at a hospital. And despite her mother's pleading, the producer insisted that Temple be at the studio in the morning or she would be replaced. According to The Atlantic, Temple also had to frequently fend off advances from men. During her first visit to MGM, the producer Arthur Freed reportedly unzipped his fly in front of Temple. Producer David O. Selznick also literally chased a terrified Temple, who was 17 at the time, around an office. Furthermore, in 1939, a woman tried to assassinate Temple because she believed the actress had stolen her daughter's soul. Temple was also plagued by various rumors, such as that her hair wasn't real or that she wasn't really a child. Some even claimed that her teeth had been filed to appear more like baby teeth. Often, fans would pull on her hair to check if it were a wig or not. Temple herself wished that she had been able to wear a wig, since her real hair warranted nightly rituals that included a weekly vinegar rinse that caused her eyes to burn. Nighty night! The rumor that she wasn't actually a child was so widespread that the Vatican sent Father Silvio Massanti to investigate Temple's true age. Shirley Temple's popularity began to wane as she grew up and matured. According to The Atlantic, Temple had already started to age out of commercial viability at just 12 years old. After one of her movies, The Bluebird, did poorly at the box office in 1940, Fox dropped her contract. And although she signed with MGM, she never made another hit like the ones from her childhood. During this time, Temple started going to school again in Los Angeles and began to focus on a non-celebrity life. As she continued her schooling, Temple continued to appear in various films throughout the 1940s, such as That Hagen Girl and The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer. But despite receiving critical praise, none were box office successes. Her final film, A Kiss for Corliss, came out in 1949, and it also received a lukewarm reception. Temple had married fellow actor John Agar in 1945, hoping that he could protect her from the muddled life of Hollywood. But instead, Agar turned out to be a violent alcoholic who only added to Temple's troubles. They divorced a few years later in 1949, which just added to her adult image. Finding it more and more difficult to land major roles, Temple stepped away from the big screen. After Shirley Temple married Charles Alden Black and they moved to Washington, D.C. for his career, Temple started working as a Republican fundraiser. In 1967, Temple turned her full attention to politics and entered the congressional race in California. Although she ultimately lost, her political career was only just beginning. Temple was a lifelong member of the Republican Party and campaigned for Richard Nixon in 1968. Temple served as a United States ambassador to the United Nations from 1969 to 1970 under President Nixon. President Gerald Ford also appointed Temple as the United States ambassador to Ghana from 1974 to 1976. Her political work continued when, in 1976, Temple became the first woman to be United States Chief of Protocol at the State Department, serving until 1977 under President Ford. In 1988, Temple was given the first honorary title of Foreign Service Officer in recognition of her work as a diplomat. Temple also worked alongside her former co-star Ronald Reagan, with whom she had starred in 1947's That Hagen Girl, as a foreign affairs officer expert while he was president. I wish I'd never heard of you. Ever since you've been here, things have changed. At the time when Shirley Temple was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1972, the disease was rarely talked about, especially in public. Celebrities at the time also frequently hid their illnesses from the public. But Temple sought to dispel the stigma and shame around breast cancer. So when she underwent a mastectomy, she spoke to reporters directly from her hospital bed, as the New York Times reported. While she was recovering in the hospital, Temple explained to reporters how a cancerous lump had been discovered in her left breast and that the breast had to be removed as a result. Not only was it uncommon for a celebrity to be as candid about their illness and its treatment, the openness with which Temple discussed her breast cancer diagnosis was also aimed at providing information to women that doctors at the time weren't necessarily giving. At the time, informed consent also wasn't common, and many women who thought they were just having a biopsy would wake up to find that they'd undergone a radical mastectomy. According to a 1972 medical document, this was because doctors at the time assumed the entire burden of deciding how patients with breast cancer should be treated. But as Temple advocated for self-examinations, she became an outspoken advocate for women's agency in regards to their health. Shirley Temple was appreciated across political party lines, and in 1998, President Clinton awarded her the Kennedy Center Honors in recognition of her years of diplomatic service. After her work in politics, Temple went on to serve on the board of directors for a number of organizations, not limited to Bank of America, the Walt Disney Company, and the National Wildlife Federation. In 2006, she was also awarded the Screen Actors Guild Lifetime Achievement Award. Even though Temple's film career lasted a relatively brief 20 years, she made an unforgettable impression. Her husband, Charles Black, had died the year before, so their son accompanied her to the award ceremony. 
Temple didn't distinguish much between her entertainment career and her political career during her life, claiming once that she thought politicians were just like actors. And for her, the years she spent in social service were just as enjoyable as her years in Hollywood. On February 10, 2014, Shirley Temple died from pneumonia and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease COPD, at the age of 85. She was survived by her three children and millions of fans around the globe. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.